Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Guy, fantastic. Mate, I ask everyone on the show, um, if a complete stranger walked up to you in a barbecue and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say these days? <laughs> Crikey. Um, that's a really, really good question. What do I do for a living? Um, I think I'd probably grasp around and try and find some really smart ass answer, you know, and then failing that, I think I'd probably say, well, I, I flip snags. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to answer your question, what do I do for a living? I, I guess, the complete way that I can really explain that is that I'm a storyteller um, and I tell stories in whatever medium really best suits that story. For instance, at the moment, you're talking to me about a film on intuition, a documentary film, but this is the first documentary I've made in something like 30 years. Um, mainly I do feature films. Um, but at the same time, I have a three book deal with Penguin Random House for a series of young adult novels um, based around the world of modern day witchcraft. Um, and they're, they're selling really well as well. So you see, what I, what I do as a storyteller is I, I basically straddle whatever medium best suits that story. Beautiful, beautiful. So I guess my question to you is, first of all, on your own personal journey, did you ever, from when you were making movies, did you ever think you'd be making a, a documentary on intuition? Never, never in my wildest dreams. I didn't, I really didn't think my life would be going this way. Um, it, it has sort of come as a surprise to me, really, um, that this has all come about. But really, you know, when I, when I think back on it, it's really come about through the characteristic that I have that has driven me through my entire life, that is curiosity. This incident happened to me, a voice saved my life, and I couldn't get this incident out of my head. And the way I explore the world really is through story. Um, and the best way for me to explore what happened when that voice intervened was to make a film about it. Mm -hmm. So really, in a, in a sense, the film, I mean, people say it's a personal journey, but really it's a personal exploration. I figured that if I was able to satisfy my curiosity as to what happened to me, then I hoped that other people would be interested as well. Got it. And you mentioned the incident or a incident. When did it happen? Talk us through it. What was happening in your life at that point? An incident happened and then what happens after that? Well, what happened was this. I, I was actually working on a movie. I was producing and directing a, a big budget thriller in New Orleans at the time. Cool. Um, in 1999, this was. It was very, very early in the production. I was there by myself. And I had to leave New Orleans very early one morning to go to the airport to catch a flight back to Los Angeles. I was driving to the airport. It was before dawn. It was dark. There were no cars on the road. And as I was approaching an intersection, I had a green light up ahead. I went to accelerate um, to make sure that I got through on the green light because I didn't want to be held up on a red light. And a voice came in and said, slow down. And I thought, I haven't had enough coffee. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I must be still dreaming. And of course I ignored it and I went to accelerate again. The voice came in a second time, more emphatically, slow down. And I did slow down and then a huge truck ran a red light on the cross street and literally I then jammed on the brakes. But had I not listened to that voice and had that, had that voice not told me to slow down, that truck would have killed me. Amazing. And was that, was that voice as like as clear as you and I having a conversation, like it felt external from something. Yeah. Look, the best way that I can describe it, and I've sort of gone back over it in my mind, of course, obviously many times trying to really clarify, but the best way I can describe it is, you know, not, not like over, over the ear headphones like this, but you know, when you've got buds like you've got in your, you know, your, um, your, your ear pieces at the moment, yeah. you know, where the sound is both sort of inside your head and outside your head. Um, that's the best way that I could describe it. I couldn't locate it at any particular place, but it was, it was sort of, it was both inside me and outside me. Wow. So, so then what happened after that? Did you then, 
I'm assuming you didn't wake up the next day, go, right, I'm going to make a movie on intuition. Like, how, so how, what were the next steps from that point? Do you think? Well, it's um, immediately I was really shaken up. Um, I mean, I was shaken up, not, not so much by the voice, but by the fact that I'd nearly, you know, I'd, I'd narrowly uh, escaped death. I really had. Um, but then I had a plan to catch. I had a movie to make. And quite frankly, I forgot all about it you know, because I had other things that were more pressing. And, but then once the film was finished, and I kept on having recollections of, of this truck going through, just ne nearly missing me, and recollections of the voice. And it started to play on my mind, and I started to... I then started to think, well, what the bloody hell happened? And um, but that was in 1999, and then I went back over my records just recently, and it wasn't until five years later that I actually wrote the first treatment uh, for the film. And that treatment, in fact, was what I think a, a little birdie told me, <laughs> I think was what the original title of the film was at that point. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's really interesting, Guy, because if somebody walked up to me at that point and said, look, here's the money to make the, make the movie, and I got up and made it, it wouldn't be anything nearly like the kind of film that I ended up making. What happened was from 2004 to 2014, which is when I started filming, it took three years to film, um, wow. but, but 10 years, that 10 year intervening period was really crucial, not only in the development in the, of the film, but also in the development of my thinking, you know, because when I started out, I didn't have a clue what intuition was. And I really didn't know what, I, you know, I was sort of summing around in the dark. I, I thought I knew, at that point, but I really didn't know. And it took me a long, long time. And the thing about it was that what I, what I discovered was this, you can't make a film on intuition using your rational brain. And of course, as a filmmaker, that's what you do. You know, that's what you do all the time. You, you've got to be rational because there's money at stake, there's, there's uh, schedules, there's budgets, there's obligations that you have to other people, investors and so forth. And so you have to act very rationally and very responsibly. Um, I discovered that you can't make a film on intuition this way. The only way to make a film on intuition is to make it intuitively. And that means um, throwing all that other stuff out the window. And you see, this is one of the reasons why it took me so long to make the movie, 10 years, you know, 10 years you know, for me to, for to start. Because I tried to make the film the other way. I tried to make the film the way I've made my previous films. You see, up until that point, I'd made 15 movies. Wow. You know, 15 feature films as a producer and director. So I knew how to put a film together, but I couldn't get this film over the line. And it was only later when I looked back on it that I realised that the reason that I couldn't get the film up and running was because I was approaching it all wrong. I was approaching it in a very logical, methodical, um, rational, ego-based way. And it just wasn't working. And... Basically, the film shook me up, slapped me around the chops and said, mate, you got this all wrong. <laughs> you got you to throw all this out the window and start again and start to make the film intuitively. And that's what I did. Wow. I love it. There's so many life lessons we can carry on with anything we do in life, right? O outside Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. So I guess the next question I want to ask you, were you scared to allow that trust to happen, to go, you know what, I'm just going to follow what my heart is saying, not my head. And I have no idea if this makes sense or not, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Oh, look, it was a terrifying prospect, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I think it took me so long to actually start. Um, because, you see, when we have control, we believe that we're safe. You know, there, there's a certain safety in having control over things. When you act intuitively, or if you, go, if you start to set about to make a film intuitively, what that means is you, you say, no, I'm going to step aside from control. I'm going to allow the universe, spirit, um, whatever, to, to lead me and guide me. And that takes enormous amount of, of trust and that takes courage. But you see, it hadn't worked the other way. You know, I, I, it hadn't worked the rational way. And I was really faced with this dilemma of, well, do I make this film or not? If I, if I make the film, then I've got, to, I've got to play by the rules. And the rules are you've got to do it intuitively. But you see, what, what, what happened was I, I had... The trigger point for this was that I had a dream. Um, 
I had a ver what turned out to be a very prophetic dream. And I won't go into the details of the dream necessarily because, you know, probably other people would find it boring. <laughs> but essentially what the dream told me was that I had to make the film uh, in a very unorthodox way. Uh, I had to throw out all my old rules and paradigms and so forth. Um, that I had to do it on whatever resources came to hand, that I shouldn't necessarily wait for the budgets that I wanted and the crew sizes that I wanted and, and the infrastructures and all that sort of thing. I had to go out and do it straight away. I had to jury rig it, if you like, but I had to do it. Well, the thing about it is that I woke up out of that dream with a very clear directive and understanding that this is the way that I had to make the film. I looked across the bedside table and it was 4.44 in the morning. So I knew enough. I didn't know anything really about numerology, but I knew enough to know that that was weird. <laughs> and, and so immediately what I did is I grabbed my iPad because, you know, being a type A personality as I was at the time, um, I always slept with my iPad. And I, <laughs> and I, um, I Googled what does 4.44 mean? And up came several entries all essentially saying the same thing but essentially what they said was that 444 is a powerful angelic number telling me that at that moment i was surrounded by my angels my archangels and my spirit guides that were urging me to move forward with my endeavors and that if i trusted my inner wisdom and my intuition and the word intuition was there specifically then i would be led to success well having come having woken up straight out of that dream that was very clear and then reading this, you know, seeing that I'd woken up at 4.44 and then reading, reading what 4.44 meant, lying there in bed that morning at four, probably 4.45 <laughs> at that point, I knew I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision as to whether or not I believed that or whether or not I just put it down to some crazy, you know, sort of early morning sort of woo-woo nonsense and just go back to sleep and just forget about it. But I knew that if I, I knew that if I did that, then I wouldn't make the film. But the, but the other thing too is this guy, and that is that I think probably at that moment that I knew that I had to make a decision, I knew that my life would change. I knew at that moment at 4.44 in the morning, my life would change if I decided that I would believe this. And you see, you've got you to gotta understand, I came from a secular background. My parents were dentists. I didn't believe in angels or any of this stuff. But for me, it was just so powerful. The dream was powerful. And then waking up at 4.44 and then seeing what that meant, it was, for me, there was just no choice. I had, to, I had to run with it. And then having made that decision to run with it, the film then came into creation and it did change my life. Amazing, amazing. It's like, um, it's almost like a school of an initiation, isn't it? Or something where, you know, and it's, it happened very similar to me in my own personal life where, cause I've literally done a huge transition in my career and my business to come and do what I'm doing now and, and actually teach meditation and this work to other people. But I had to walk the path first, truly live in those, in, in that essence of, of having to understand that deeply, not just analytically. And it wasn't until I crossed that river of change stepping into that unknown i never fully understood it even though i was very passionate about it and, and lived it and i'm forever grateful for it mm. for yeah. sure what does um do you live your life like that constantly now i do i do it's um um i can't i can't live any other way and you know look i gotta say i try it you know because during the three three four years it took to make the movie i it's not like at that moment of 444, I was a convert and, you know, and it was straight sailing from then on. I had doubts and I had fears and I, I went back to rational thinking at times and so forth and, and trying to, you know, think things through logically. But what happened was that every time I did that, I got blocked and, uh, and things stopped. And it was really interesting, Guy, because, because you know, what was happening was that, was that I was sort of always testing whether or not I was sort of on the right path. And the only way that I found that I was on the right path is when I went on the other path, things just didn't happen. And so I started slowly and what it wasn't, like I say, it wasn't like bang like this, you know, I wake up at 4.44 and suddenly I'm intuitive. 
<laughs> it took bloody years. You know, it really did. And, and, and it's still a process. You know, you must know this yourself. You know, I mean, you know, life throws, it throws these things at you. And what I've come to understand is that spirit challenges you. And oftentimes, it, you know, it sort of shakes you up and goes, well, you know, do, are you for real, mate? You know, is this, and it throws all sorts of stuff at you, you know, and you've really got to, you really got to dig deep, you know, as you said before, um, and just work out who you really are. That's what it comes down to, who you really are. That's the truth of you. Absolutely. What, um, let's talk about the movie. So if, um, again, if I was a stranger and you had to do a quick synopsis, an elevator pitch of how you constructed it and what it is, what would you say? Oh, crikey. Um, look, on one, on one level, it's one man's journey to find his soul. Um, on another level, it is a nuts and bolts practical examination of what intuition is, how it works, and how you can bring it into your life. You see, look, I, before I said about making the film, I, I looked at other films that had tried to make, you know, tried try to, to make, um, make a documentary on intuition. And for me, they all... Um, they didn't work because what they, what they tried to do is they tried to prove that intuition exists. You know, that seemed to be the substance of, of, of the films that I saw on intuition. Um, and they tried to balance it. You know, I, I didn't want to make a balanced film. I wanted to make a deeply personal film. I wanted to make a deeply biased film. And I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to start off with does intuition exist? Bloody hell, intuition saved my life. <laughs> you know, I started off with, this happened to me. This was intuition. Okay, now what is that? And how does it work? And how can I access it again? How can I bring this into my life so that I can make better choices? Because when it comes down to it, what I discovered in the making of the film is that in the end, intuition is a means by which you can make better choices in your life. It's really as simple as that. I call it, I call it intuitive hits DDMs, direct divine messaging. <laughs> that's what I am. I love it. I love it. So, you what blew me away because when I was researching you yesterday as well, Bob, was the, the the thoroughness of the amount of footage and filming you did to construct this documentary together. So, when you started to make the movie, did you like? I'm assuming if you're following your intuition, like, did you know how many speakers you were going to interview at the time, or did it, like? How, how did you go about finding them? <laughs> well, look, after that, after that, um, after that dream and, and having made a decision to make the film, um, the one thing that intuitively I knew is that I had to go to India. I had to start in India because I knew that I knew that I knew nothing and that probably in India I would start to learn some stuff. Um, and so you know, I had, I had no money, no, no money in the budget to make the movie or anything like that. So, but I went out and, you know, my wife and I put in some savings. We went and bought camera, booked some tickets to India and started there. And I didn't have, I didn't have a clue who I was going to talk to, how many people it was, you know, and I didn't know how long the filming was going to take. All I knew was that I had to start. And here's, okay, so here's another story, right? Um, you know, there, there's a little bit of sense, you know, sensibility in me really, you know, as a filmmaker. And so having, having chipped in our own money and, you know, started, started the process, I thought, well, bloody hell, I should <laughs> see if I can line up some people in India beforehand. But I get on the phone, I've, you know, I've, I've been to India before and I've, I've actually worked there before, so I knew some people. And I, I called them up and I said, you know, can I do you know people? Can I come and talk to them? And can I come and talk to you and so forth? I kept on getting no, 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 no. Block, 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 block. Anyway, so I'm on the plane um, with my wife. It's just the two of us, right? And she turns to me and she says, we're going to be landing in Mumbai soon. You don't have anybody to talk to, do you? And I went, no, I don't. Anyway, so, so we're in the back of the cab. We've arrived in Mumbai. And we're in the back of the cab. 
heading to the heading to the hotel that I booked, I've got this sort of really kind of cold, sweaty kind of dread, you know, going, what am I doing? You know, I'm starting this film, and what am I going to do? Sit around the pool and you know, eat samosas? <laughs> What's going on here? Anyway, at that moment, guys, really, really interesting. What happened was I I had in my mind's eye this image of a billboard that I'd seen by the highway on the way in from the, from the airport to the, to the city. And the billboard, I, you know, I could see it very, very clearly, was advertising the Bombay Yoga Institute with a telephone number and so forth underneath. And I thought, okay, well, look, I'll, I'll contact them. So I had my trusty iPad and roaming in the back of the cab. And so literally from the back of the cab, I Googled, Bombay Yoga Institute, and up it came, and the telephone number. I called them from the back of the cab, and I said, look, I'm a filmmaker from Australia. I'm making a film on intuition. Can I come and speak to the director? And they said, yeah, sure, come in the next day. All right, so I had my first interview lined up just from the back of the cab there, based on this image of my seeing this billboard. But anyway, so, so we, you know, the, the, the taxi continued through to, uh, to the hotel. I never saw the billboard. I thought, that's strange. They must have taken it down. Anyway, so I got to the... the um, the Institute, the Bombay Yoga Institute the next day, and there is the billboard outside the front entrance, exactly as I'd seen it in my mind's eye. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'd seen. So I did the interview with the director, a wonderful lady, and she's in the movie. And at the end of it, I said, what happened to the billboard that you had out by the, you know, by the highway coming in from the airport? And she said, we never had a billboard there. And I said, you must have, because I've seen it before. And she said, no. Um, no, we've never had a billboard other than, you know, the one outside our front entrance. Well, I've never been to the Bombay Yoga Institute before. I'd never even been to that part of Bombay before. So it was not possible for me to have seen that billboard outside their front entrance. But what had happened was that precognitively, precognitively, I had got this flash of that billboard outside that entrance. So my guidance had taken me to that place for me to start. It was extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I, I, you know, it's, it's one of several things that, you know, several very, very strange things that have happened to me in the making of the film. But what happened, though, Guy, was this. After having done that interview with a lady who was really wonderful, which is one of the sort of key people in the uh, yoga, Hindu, you know, religion, whatever, in, in India, she then put me onto somebody at, um, at the ashram in Rishikesh, at Parmath Nikitan Ashram. Mm -hmm. They then put me onto other people and so forth. And really, from that first interview with that director at that Bombay Yoga Institute, I didn't stop. I just went from person to person to person to person. And the same thing happened in America when I went to America. I was guided from one person to the other. I never had a list. I never, you know, I, I just... And, and so, look, sometimes I was given, I was given access to people. Like, for instance, I was given access to um, Bikram Chowdhury, you know, from Bikram Yoga. For some reason or other, I had a no on him. And I went, no, I'm not going to follow this. Well, he, you know, he turned out to be you know, not a very nice man. Yeah. At least on the film. But it was really interesting. I got a no on him. And he would have been a big name in the movie. Amazing. You know, at the time. So whilst I was guided to people like James Van Prague and Carolyn Mace and... You know, Lee Carroll and so forth. I was also guided away from people who weren't the right energetic fit for the film. That's phenomenal. And surely, like after a start like that, when you when you rock up thinking, "What the hell am I doing here?" and then you and then it just opens up like that by following it. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, it's it really is extraordinary. You know, the funny thing is now I've, I've seen the film obviously. You know hundreds of times and I sometimes stand in the back of the cinema and I, I watch the film play out and I go, how did this happen? <laughs> how did this bloody well happen? I, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I say at Q&As, I take no ownership of this movie. You've got to understand. I take no authorship of it. That's incredible. How many um, people end up being in the movie? In the movie, there are 26 people. I ended up uh, interviewing 76 in total. So 50 people hit the editing room floor. Um, I shot 120 hours of material. I ended up using uh, a bit under 90 minutes. So there was a lot of footage that I didn't use. But I've got to say, Guy, all of the, you know, for all the people that I interviewed, um, I learned from every one of them. You know, and, and my overall understanding of intuition and knowledge of intuition was informed by, by everybody that I did interview even those that didn't make the film. That's an incredible process.
Um, which, um, which person surprised you the most? That's a really good question. Um, I think the Prince of Bhutan, he was really cool. You know, it was really cool interviewing the Prince of Bhutan. But he didn't, it didn't necessarily surprise me. Oh, well, he surprised me in, in that, you know, he looked like a movie star. <laughs> that was surprising. But um, I think probably... Look, the guy that channels twice in the movie, you know, he, he, he speaks or the channel comes through and then he speaks. His name is Paul Stilling. Um, he's a New York channel and he's extraordinary. You know, the, the people, the people in, are in the movie that are the channels like Lee Carroll, who mm -hmm. channels for Cryon and so forth, and James Van Prague. The, these people are real. They have a connection to spirit and to, you know, what's behind the veil. And they are incredible and they're real. Um, but probably the person who impacted me the most was um, Puja Swamiji. He's, um, he's like the Hindu equivalent of the Dalai Lama. He's the guy with the big beard. He's the um, central casting guru. I know. <laughs> Swami. <what you're> <laughs> yeah. And he is an amazing man. He is a true holy man. Um, and even being in his presence, you, you know, you are impacted by his energy. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. And how, how has the, the film been received? Uh, the film, the film has been received more. I, I can't begin to tell you how, how overwhelmed I've been at times to the reception of the film. It, it has, it seems to have, really hit a chord with a lot of people. Look, there's some people who aren't ready for it, you know, and they come out and the best they can say is, well, it's given me a lot to think about, Bill. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> um, but most of the people who make the decision to go to the film um, are inclined towards taking on these concepts and are in the process of waking up, waking up if not having woken up entirely. And so many people have come up to me afterwards after a screening and said, this film is going to change my life. In fact, I had one person, one young man come up to me afterwards after the screening. It was very, very skittish. He was sort of, you know, hovering on the outside of a group of people who wanted to talk to me and, and he sort of darted in and he, he just said very quickly, I was going to kill myself. Uh, I was going to, uh, I was going to commit suicide. I can't remember exact words, but something like I was going to commit suicide, but I've seen this film now and now I'm not, and then he just walked up. Wow. And that, that was amazing. Um, and follow-up emails and, you know, and friendships that my wife and I have made after the film and so forth. The film, the film is, is, is connecting on a deep, resonant kind of level with people. Yeah. yeah I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. I really wasn't. Yeah, it's amazing. And what would you say to the person who's very... I don't know, analytical or skeptical listening to this? Okay. Well, what I, what I would say is that um, is I would repeat what Lee Carroll says in the movie, and that is that there are some people who just aren't ready for it, and that's okay. You know, um, come back to it when you are ready, and it might be another lifetime. <laughs> you know, it yeah. might not be this lifetime. And what Lee Carroll says is that um, he, he says he's not trying to evangelize um, this stuff. If, if you, if you are interested in it and you want to explore more, then it's a resource that's available to you. And by resource, I mean, intuition is a resource that's available to you. Um, a lot of people of course are scared of intuition because, um, intuition almost by definition means that you're dealing with the ephemeral, the unknown. Um, but the one thing that I would say to those people is that true discovery, true creativity, true originality, true freshness comes out of what's not known. You know, when you, when you use your rational thinking, when you use your ego based mind, what you're doing is you're drawing from what's past, what's known, you know, what has gone before. And you, and because of that, there'll always be a certain staleness to the ideas that you come up with. Intuition is going to lead you into a realm of expansion. Uh, yeah, absolutely, it's going to lead you into the unknown, but in the, in the unknown is discovery and creativity, true creativity. And that's where intuition can really, really have a, a 
incredibly useful impact, not only on an individual, but on the world. Yeah, I love it. Do you, do you have any personal daily practices to continue to develop your intuition at all, or do you just? Um, it's a really good question. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you need to meditate. Um, I don't believe that. Uh, what I, one of the things that I'm really interested in is the concept of real world intuition. And real world intuition is not, you know, going to the Ganges and sitting in the lotus position and, you know, and chanting home. Real world intuition is, you know, getting up, having a shower, um, and in the shower, you know, then allowing thoughts to come and, and watching them. I mean, truly, most of my, intu my big intuitive insights have happened in the shower. Um, you, you know, because you're still in that part dream state where you, you know, your, your soul hasn't come back into your body totally. Um, you've got the warmth, you've got the feeling of the, you know, the, the hot water pounding on you and so forth. It, it is a very meditative uh, space and time having a shower in the morning, you know, and, and I say to people, that's real world intuition. Um, you know, grab it when you can and you don't need to have 20 minutes meditating to be intuitive. But one of the things that you've got to do, I mean, it's really interesting. I've written, a, I've written a book that is coming out soon when the film comes out online. And the book expands on what I've learned, you know, what I've learned in the making of the film. Um, I wasn't able to put everything that I've learned in the film itself for, for reasons of time I put it in the book. But one of the things that I, that I explore in the book is this notion that you have to be, number one, you've got to acknowledge that intuition exists. That's really important because a lot of people don't even acknowledge it exists. Then you've got to be willing to work with it. Um, and that willingness is terribly important. If you are willing, then that starts the process. And then there are other things too that you need to do. And, you know, trust is one of the big ones. Um, but, but being willing and paying attention to the small things around you. Because one of the things that I've learned is this, is that intuition will ping you all the time. Now, I use this technology term, but, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, gonna, it's pinging you in a whole bunch of different ways. And if it can't get your attention one way, it's going to get your attention another way. It might be a gut feeling, you know, and you ignore it, you know, and then it might be something here on the radio, maybe something in, in a news broadcast or something on the TV, you know, a phrase or somebody saying something that is exactly what you needed to hear at that moment for you to go, right, okay, I've got to do that now. Um, or it might be, you know, some other way. So one of the things that I've learned is that intuition is creative and persistent, but to be open to that, you've got to pay attention and pay attention both to what's inside you and what's outside you, because that's the way intuition connects. Right. You develop an awareness. Yep. Yep. Do you find it simple now, I say now, uh, to distinguish what's intuition and what's just, the monkey mind thoughts and going on. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because um, it used to be a problem, it's less so now. Um, your intuitive mind will leave you in no doubt and it will give you a sense of surety and a sense of comfort and there will be absolutely no indecisiveness. Um, your ego-based mind that really wants to take control you know, it, it, wants, it wants to rule the, rule the roost. It wants to be king of the castle. Um, and it's going to be louder, you know, and more belligerent and more persuasive. But implicit in that ego-based mind is fear. Intuition never deals in fear at all. It never, ever deals in fear and never deals in doubt. There is just a, a quiet certainty within, with the intuitive voice with the ego-based voice, there's shouting and belligerence and doubt and fear. And that's really the, the, the singular difference between the two of them. Got it. And being able to distinguish the two. Do you, so as you develop this skill, do, do you, has it affected like your stress levels, your decision-making from fear-based and like in general? Yeah. What, what I've discovered is that when you start to really live an intuitive life, a whole lot of fears drop away. Um, because if you do believe that you are being guided, then what's there to fear? Carolyn May says something really interesting in the movie. She says, um, Carolyn May is, you know, an extraordinary, of course, uh, intuitive scholar and speaker. But she says, 
what's a bad thing? How do you know something is a bad thing? And, you know, when you, it's, it's really very simple what she says, but it's actually very, very profound. You know, so, so, you know, something that we think is an absolutely critical disaster might end up being the best thing for us. You know, but at the time, we can't see that. Um, you know, your guidance works in a whole bunch of different ways, and it's not always in, in ways that you think are necessarily going to be warm and fuzzy and cosy. You know, it, it will challenge you and shake you up and, and, and present struggles and difficulties for you. But that's not necessarily, as Carolyn Mace says, a bad thing. You know, so, so if you take on board this concept of what is a bad thing, you know, how, do you know, how do you know something is a bad thing? You might lose all your money and think, well, you know, you, you lose your house or, you know, you crash your car or something like that and you think that's a disaster. But is it? You know, when you look back on it five, ten years later, it might well have been that, that thing that you needed to change your life, change your life in fundamental ways that, you know, that, um, that have improved your life mm. dramatically. So to get back to your question, um, if you accept the notion that your life is being guided and that your, your basic task is to try and keep on your destiny path, and that's where your intuition kicks in. Your intuition tries to keep you on your destiny path. Then all you've got to do is trust that intuition and then everything's going to be okay and the fears drop away. You like the point in. Yeah. That's actually a perfect segue for the next question that I ask everyone on the show, though. And that is, what is one of your low points in your life you've had that later in life turned out to be a blessing? Oh, crikey. I've, <laughs> I've had so many low points. You want to, should we list them alphabetically <laughs> or chronologically? Um, uh, you know, look, I'll, I'll tell you something. I don't tell this story terribly often, but it's probably relevant here. Um, I started off studying medicine. Uh, like I said, my, my parents were dentists. I, with, because of something that happened intuitively, I switched across I, my, 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 my head wasn't in medicine. I switched across to um, journalism. Um, I became quite a successful journalist. I won awards for my journalism and so forth. And I end up being on the top show as a, as a television reporter at a very young age at, at the top top TV show uh, in, in Australia as a, as the senior reporter at the senior reporter at the young age of like twenty five or something. Mm. But I had a bad car accident. I was in one of the film vehicles coming back from a story and I was in the back seat, the car left, left the road, hit a telegraph pole. I was in the spine unit for three months and it was touching as to whether or not I could walk again. Well, I was at the height of my success as a young television reporter. I just won a Logie for television reporter of the year, which, you know, as you know, is I guess probably the equivalent of a, an Emmy or something like that. And I was right at this high point of my career and then suddenly bang, I'm in hospital in the spinal unit. And what happened was this, it wiped the slate clean and I saw my life in absolute clarity and I saw that what I was doing was absolute total crap and I had to change my life fundamentally. You know, I got out of hospital and I resigned. I just picked up the Logie for television report of the year and the next day I put in, put in my resignation and said, I'm out of here. And I wanted to go back to authentic storytelling so i went back to the abc and joined the documentary unit making documentaries about country people <laughs> i dropped i dropped salary by about two-thirds um but you know it was really interesting so so how i see it is this is that it's very easy for us to leave our destiny path and sometimes because of our characteristics, our personal characteristics, we can be quite good at going down that alternate route. Well, if spirit has designs for you, it's going to try and wrench you away. Um, but in my instance, it took a, <laughs> a bloody big car crash to do that. Well, that's, how I see it. that's how I see that happening. comes back to what Carolyn May said. How do you know, how, you know, what do you know is a bad thing? How do you know it's a bad thing? I'm in a spinal unit with a broken back and, you know, a leg broken in 14 places and internal injuries. And you'd think that's a bad thing. It turned out to be the best thing for me because if, if I hadn't made that change, 
probably I would have gone under 60 minutes and I would have, you know, um, taken a path like, you know, one of those television reporters would have done. And I never would have been here now talking to you about having made a film on intuition. And so, all those lives. Yeah. So that was a low point in my life, but it turned out to be fundamental to who I am right now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Bill. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone tonight and anywhere in the world from any time frame, who would it be and why? Oh, I would like to have dinner with Jesus Christ. And I'm not a Christian. You know, I'm not a Christian. Um, but if I had the opportunity, he'd be a pretty cool dude to have dinner with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there'd be a few questions I'd have to ask him. Yeah. He, he's actually a pretty popular answer on the podcast. Oh, is he really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, but you see, I'm not, I'm not a Christian at all, and, and I don't follow any particular religion at all. Um, but in terms of interesting people, um, you know, he'd be, you know, he'd be interesting dude to talk to. Yeah, he'd have some stuff to say, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there'd be plenty of uh, wine and, you know, so forth. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners to ponder on from everything that we've covered today? Look, one of the things that has come from my making the film is a notion of first thought, best thought. That your first thought is your intuitive thought and it's your best thought. That most times we don't trust it. We think, oh, that's just some crazy wildly field thought and we dismiss it, you know, because it's too dangerous, it's too scary. And we just, we, we just go, oh, that's interesting. Bing, it's out. And we go with our second thought, which is our rational, safe thought. And that's what keeps us contained. That's what keeps us small. That's what keeps us limited. But if you start to make, if you start to live your life by the notion of, I'm going to run with first thought, best thought, then suddenly a whole lot of stuff can open up for you, which is really quite extraordinary. And then get ready for the ride. Exactly. Exactly. I love it, Bill. I love it. And now you're, uh, Movie is coming out to DVD. Uh, it's soon? it's coming out. It's yeah. It's um it's been playing in these small kind of pop up theatrical screenings, both in Australia and the US, uh, which has started to get you know the film noticed and talk on social media and so forth. Pardon me. We're releasing the film online for streaming, uh, download, and DVD on in America on the tenth of October at ten pm. Eastern summertime, so it's 10, 10 at 10. Um, in Australia, that translates to something a little less sexy. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's on the 11th at, at midday. Yeah, it's, so it's the 10th, 11th, 12th. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> 11th, 12th, beautiful, absolutely. And, and you, you mentioned a book as well. When will that be coming out? Well, that's coming out at the same time. So, so the film and the book will be com coming out simultaneously. Beautiful. And the book's really been quite interesting because what it does is it includes a lot of the content of the film, um, a lot of the quotes that, you know, from the key people in the film. But like I say, it also expands on it as well. Yeah, love it. And uh, the best URL to send everyone? Um, the movie's website, pgsthemovie.com. Easy. I'll be linking to the show notes in there, bro. That was awesome. amazing. Thank you so much for sharing everything today. I, I love every minute of that. Oh, uh, it's an absolute pleasure, Guy. Thank you. You're welcome, Bill. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, man.